Welcome to part two of this out of line discussion with William Matthews. All right, now we're going to talk about actual social media. Are you ready for this? I wanna, I wanna ask you the questions. All right, ask me questions. Okay, so I know that you are on all of the channels, but how did you get started in social media, and kind of which channel is is kind of your fave, or does it change a lot? Yeah, Uh, I just thought of this the other day. My dad, when I was uh, younger, I was born in 1983, was born by the river. No. <laughs> That'd be uh, kind of sexy. Yeah, it would be. Uh, maybe not for your mom. Maybe they conceived me by the river. I don't know. Oh. Ooh. Wedding watches. Yeah, <laughs> wedding watches. Hashtag it. Let's start it. Make it a new thing. Uh, people are like, I've deconstructed for my marriage and now we wear wedding watches. Okay, fine. Whatever. Life is a circle. <laughs> yeah, life is a circle. Um. My dad used to work for IBM, and so he was a stay-at-home dad, and he would work, uh, go fix computers at, like, malls and stores for IBM, IBM computers. Back in, like, 1987, 89, 90. Wow. Um, and we had an IBM computer. So I grew up with Atari. I, my parents wouldn't do the Nintendo thing. My, my cousins had it, though. And I grew up with a PC, like, back in 1990, like, or whatever, like an IBM computer. I had floppy. I knew as a kid how to do floppy disks, play games. Like, I felt like I've always been technologically savvy because my dad was like we had cds before they were popular my dad bought a cd player and taught this is a cd you know this is how it breaks this is how you can clean it you know and they get scratches and be careful like we were doing that (laughs) i remember doing that in like 1992 like before cds were really super popular like or maybe even before that going to borders books and music and whatever so i've always been on the next wave i feel like or catching it on the next wave I was I was doing Zanga before all of my friends. Remember Zanga? Oh, I had one. Did you? Yes. I did. I was on Zanga. I feel like with my friend group particularly, I was in, on Zanga first. I was on MySpace first. Then I jumped from MySpace when that wasn't cool. I remember with MySpace, you could like rate your top friends, like your top like 10 friends. And then you would change it constantly depending on which ones you fell in out of favor <laughs> with. You're like, I don't like her anymore. I don't like I him anymore. Like he, he's weird to me now. So I'm going to put him number seven. <laughs> you know, I actually missed that feature because it was like a public display of affection for other people. And I think we we need that back. Come on, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Like, I need to have the public. I need people to know who my top favorites are. Like, I need the world to know. And, and if you lose a ranking, you need to know. Uh huh. You need to know. Mm-hmm. You <laughs> but, tell uh, them. I know. MySpace used to do that. I was on MySpace first. I was back on Facebook. Like, I was on Facebook right after it stopped being for college campuses. Like, back in maybe, was it 2003, four. I think uh, so, yeah. I was I was on uh, Facebook then, uh, jumped on it. And then after that, what was after that? It was Twitter. Mm-hmm. And then I jumped on Twitter and then Instagram uh, and then Snapchat. Did you do Vine? I did Vine for a moment too. Uh, I just was never good at like doing the little like, it felt like it became more about the fun viral videos, you know, than just your everyday life. So Vine kind of faded out. I was on Periscope first. Uh, yeah. So I've always just jumped on the platforms. Uh, but I would say out of all the platforms, Twitter is my favorite. And it's not even the one that I have the most follows on or the most uh, numbers on. But it's the one that I feel the most free to be myself. It's also the one that I think vibes my personality more. I'm a bit, I'm a five on the Enneagram, though some of you would debate I'm a four. Uh, and I'm I'm open. <laughs> but uh, I'm very heady, cerebral, like in my head and analytical and ob- observational and investigative. And so Twitter is the best platform to me for that, as well as it's like breaking news fast. It's like in the moment. Um, it also I feel like it forces people to hone in their thoughts mm. uh, versus Facebook, where you can just talk for a long time and rant. Um, Twitter f- forces you to be succinct and what you're saying and how you're saying it. And I like that. It's straight to the point, but it's also bite size and informational. And I feel like I can process more information on Twitter than any of the other sites. Um, yeah. I, Twitter's bay. Twitter makes me happy. Twitter makes me mad. Twitter makes me fall in love. Twitter makes me fall out of love. <laughs> Twitter uh, makes the world go round. Twitter is where we do our activism and advocacy now. It is how I make my voice heard in the world. Mm. Um, more so than Facebook. And, and there's a real, the way the analytics on it, I think, are just stronger in terms of instant 
how do you feel about this? Boom. Yeah. This is how we feel. And even the phenomenon of Black Twitter, which was, I, I remember watching that unfold, which, by the way, Black Twitter started by uh, the love of scandal. Black people loved scandal. Also, they were able to figure out or, or note that Black people used Twitter more in late evenings and in the late hours, where white Twitter used <laughs> used it during the day, like mornings and afternoons and stuff. And uh, But Black Twitter basically started from the love of Kerry Washington and scandal. And so Black people started talking to each other on Twitter. I also think, too, that even the Black Lives Matter phenomenon happened on Twitter first. Yeah. And the hashtagging of that and also the sharing of videos with about police brutality. Um, and that, I think, changed the world. And it changed so many of our concepts of what is right and wrong and also awakened the world to the issue of police brutality and mass incarceration. Um, and we saw the Ferguson. And by the time Ferguson came along, we were actually on the ground through Periscope. Mm. through Twitter videos, watching the police, the militarized police in those cities, um, violating people's constitutional rights on the daily. And it was, it, I felt like for the first time out of all the social media platforms I'd ever used, that one put me right in the heart of what was going on in the world. Um, and again, Periscope, I think, was ingrained in that too at, by that point um, back during the Ferguson days. So I think I... Twitter was has been the main platform that has shown me the world and has shown me more of the world and people that I disagree with. I can actually, why do they think that way? And I can actually go hashtag and find tweets and read people's live. It be, Better than Facebook, I think it became people, people begin to catalog their real life experiences in the moment. Mm. And I feel like I've grown intellectually, I've grown morally from listening to people on Twitter, um, especially people that I learned to people that are experts in what they do in different fields. Um, even journalism. It's If more people were reading Twitter during the election, we wouldn't have the president we had. Because I realized on Facebook, the disinformation was stronger and the misinformation about Hillary Clinton was stronger on Facebook than it was Twitter, even though there were tons about, there were tons of Trump bots on Twitter. But there was more of a, I think journalists were more prevalent on Twitter and you could share articles better than you could on Facebook. And I think... Uh, yeah, if more people were reading Twitter, they would have been hit with a stronger uh, balancing of anti-Trump rhetoric that they were getting on Facebook. They were just getting all anti-Hillary and hardly no anti-Trump. Mm. And on Twitter, you saw, even though there was a lot of pro-Trump on Twitter, you saw way more anti-Trump. Or just even report investigative journalism was highlighted more on Twitter than it was Facebook. Yeah, I I mean, I, I went away from Twitter for a little while. It was funny. I went through mm -hmm. all of the people that I followed and... Um, I unfollowed anyone that hadn't tweeted in at least two years. And yeah. it was so many people, which made me realize that used to be such a hub it for used me. To be. And then it sort of faded. But now with everything that's happened this year, it just seems to be like where it's, it's like important and responsible to be there because yeah. you are staying on top of what's happening in the moment. Yep. And there are more, more news things that are less algorithm faded out. Like yeah. instead of it having this weird, um, you know, feed that isn't chronological all of a sudden it seems like there's more like this is what's actually going on right now mm -hmm. this is what people are saying this yeah. is what you can do about it and I think I love Twitter as well the only thing that for me sometimes I feel like is is a consideration for myself is that it can feel a little bit soapboxy like everyone's standing yeah. on their soapbox just yelling and I'm like okay cool so yeah when are we going to step off the box and go be activists mm -hmm. because we're, if we're all just yelling mm -hmm. in this one room, then what are we actually doing? And I think that's a concern for some people and maybe not everyone. Yeah. But in general, that I think is my only – like where Instagram, my concern is that everyone's presenting curated yeah. lives. Yeah, and that's, that exactly. And that's like the Instagram fear. Not fear, but just like – And Instagram doesn't like you when you get political. And, and oh, mm -hmm. no, they do not. They want to see beauty, 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 beauty. Mm -hmm. Show me pretty and show me what makes me feel good. And and it's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're right. Uh, I, I think that's a very real concern, too. I think that's always the concern in when you're organizing and when you're like, are we just preaching to the choir? Are we simply, you know, and the way, you know, because there is algorithms and echo chambers for Twitter as well. I think it's less than Facebook or less strong, but it's still there. So then are we just preaching to the choir? And I think... In the grand scheme, I think in the short term, I think what you're saying is absolutely right. And the fear of just propping ourselves up and making ourselves feel good on our soapboxes is a real, like a type of 
political, moral, spiritual masturbation. <laughs> like we're all just feeling good because we're all saying the same shit and uh-huh. jacking each other off at yep, the same circle time. Circle jerk. Circle jerk. Jesus Christ. Did I just say circle jerk on your podcast? Oh, God. <laughs> I'll leave it to Caroline to bring out the nasty in me. Uh, I love it. <laughs> it's, but it's true, though. I mean, it's a crude analogy, but it's true. And uh, I think, though, like I would imagine if we're all wanting to mobilize for a better future, a better tomorrow, then I think it does take us sometimes all standing in the same room and yelling at each other <laughs> until we can find like a way to organize and move forward. And so I think a lot of the soapbox yelling thing right now, if, if it stays like this purely for the next two to three years, I would go, OK, guys, we 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 got to come up with a plan, yeah. you know, if and, and so I think the fear is we'll just keep yelling and never come up with a plan and a real strategy on how to organize. And we can all have different opinions and be part of different works. But I do think what's going to change is when we actually come together, even if it's just progressives, I'll take that. If no conservative wants to join the resistance because of fear or because of they're unsure, or they, you know, a lot of my friends, they would join the resistance, but they're so pro-life and they've lived and died on that hill. They have a hard time standing next to a pro-choice person. I think there are some pro-choice people that really would have a problem standing next to some pro-life people too. And um, so, but I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of pro-life people that don't like Trump and that that dividing line is really that abortion gay marriage thing because Mm. for lots of reasons. But anyway, I think even if progressives can learn how to learn the difference between an imperfect friend and an enemy and we just mobilized ourselves well, because I would put myself in the progressive camp mostly, um, politically speaking. I will vote Democrat because <laughs> the GOP is just not an option for tons of reasons. Uh, <laughs> just not. Um, and, I, and, I've, and I've said it on podcasts before. I, I voted. I never voted for Obama. I voted for McCain and Romney. I did. I didn't hate Obama, but I just I was voting for a long time. I just voted because of pro-life issues. So that was just me. I don't do that anymore, but that was me. So. I think if we can just get progressives in the same room to shout at each other, but then move the shouting into grassroots activism, mobilization. And I think the the only place it's going to probably happen is Twitter. (laughs) I hope you're right. And I'm there. I'm there with you like 100 percent. And so wherever if you if you plant grass, I'll be there. Yeah, I love that. If you plant grass, I'll be. I love that. That's incredible. (laughs) It sounds a little weedy, but even then. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's more yeah well you well yeah and and often we have to pull up the weeds in our own grass as well, progressives yeah we do i'm ready come on let's let's, let's pull it. up the weeds and and fi- and rally with the like i said we need to learn the difference between an Im- imperfect friend and a and a callous enemy mm-hmm. uh and i think this election people didn't know the difference i think progressives were trying to be too purist and didn't want to get on and i know we disagreed on this a little bit but like you know i'm like if hillary was the better train she just was with all her flaws and issues so she would be considered i would consider her an imperfect friend then uh um, though i actually think she's incredible in a lot of ways um then what we had the other option of so anyway next question i'll just i'll just stay cuddling my bernie hoodie for the rest of my day yeah yeah i love me some bernie you know we we, we've got some inside jokes on bernie that i don't think we should share (laughs) Because I've already broken too many religious taboos in my, if, if any of my religious friends listen to this podcast, they'd be concerned for my mortal soul. <laughs> I'll watch out for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which doesn't give anyone any hope. No, nope, not, okay. not one bit. <laughs> They'll come okay. for you anyway. <laughs> oh, geez. So, um, so how much of your life is online versus offline? So, I, I mean, that could be either specifically with social media or even just to do with your phone. Like, how much of your life are you on and how much of your life are you plugging the unplugging? Yeah, um, I'm on a lot uh, because it just becomes the default when you're in moments of waiting, whether you're in an office, an appointment, uh, you know, sitting on the couch waiting for your friend to come over. Like, it's just so I'm on for sure. Um, I try to I'm more observational with Twitter at, than strategic these days, though I'm going to get better. Um, meaning so I just more react and respond versus be very strategic in how I'm using it um, in this season of my life. Uh, I try to, when I'm with good friends, I try to, don't always do this well, but I do try to set my phone down for a long time. Sometimes I'll do it for like a few hours or if we're out to dinner or something and, you know, let's all just put our phones in the middle of the table and just connect. Um, 
before moving to LA, I was very much like, my life is my life and I'll put everything on social media. Um, and in a lot of ways, living in Los Angeles, my life has changed. Oftentimes the people that I'm around has changed. And, you know, a lot of our, just even within our own friend group, there are a lot of people, we're all creative entrepreneurs, a lot of us here, at least the people I hang out with, and probably a lot of people you hang out with. And so everyone's got influence and followings and, you know, and, and I have friends who are legit celebrities, you know, and so then it becomes like, I want to post about my life and I do, but then I kind of have to be a little cautious about it, or I, I choose to be a little cautious about it, only because uh, mostly it just always looks like you're flossing. <laughs> Especially living in LA, like I get that feedback when I leave LA and I go see my friends. They're like, "Oh my god, you just like party all the time." And, you're and the perception of me feels very different than what I know to be the actual reality of my life. And and then friends that come visit me in LA and then see how I use Insta Story or the, they go, "Oh, it just looks it looks greater than it actually is." <laughs> so true. And I'm like, "Yeah, you're right. It, it does just look greater than it, it actually is." And then there are times where I just go, you know, I'm literally hanging out with people that I won't name, and I'm like, I wouldn't be a good time to answer story, you mm -hmm. know, like it just, and so I learning that balance of how to protect um, and not proselytize or use any of my well-known friends. <laughs> Cause it can like, Oh my God, I'm with so-and-so. I want to get a picture and let's look, show everybody we're hanging out. And then I'm like, yeah, that, that more sounds like my ego and also sounds more like me wanting to build my brand than wanting to just honor the moment or honor the people I'm with. Cause we're genuinely connecting and, it might look good for me or look good for my status to be seen with so-and-so or whatever. And so learning to navigate that while also going, well, if so-and-so is your actual friend, you shouldn't be afraid of that either. And, and that dance of like, I don't want to be afraid of my friends that are celebrities or well-known and not, uh, you know, protect them so much where I'm afraid to even take a picture with them. Like, cause that's weird too. Uh, but then also at the same time, I want to be conscious of not presenting something to the world that is, just feels more selfish and like we said masturbation <laughs> like circle jerking like you know oh my god we're in LA and we're all so cool and we look cool and we're famous or we know famous people and yeah we're so amazing uh, I'll tag you you tag me yeah tag me like share follow <laughs> and <laughs> which truthfully for your business like do it yes like, own it like I'm all about that and I don't think you should feel bad about that um but I do think it's great to check in with your ego mm -hmm. and go what is the like what part of this is my truest intention and my true life because there are times I'm like, oh, this would be great to Insta story or Instagram. But I'm like, is this your actual life or is this just a moment you're having? Yeah, you're in Beverly Hills at this house party hanging out with celebrities. But is this your actual life or is this just like, and then I'm going, oh, this is not my actual life. Like I actually might see these people from time to time, but they're not my actual friends. Mm. And so I don't want to make it perceive like, like they are yeah. and, and just be sensitive to that. Mm. That's how I live my life. So my online versus my real life it looks a lot different truthfully and i think it should look different for all of us because we all have real life and real joy and i don't even always share my joy on twitter i noticed that i was like i'm mostly protesting and dissenting on twitter which is <laughs> what i use it for but in terms of what actually really makes me happy i'm happy a lot and i get happy about a lot of things i'm tro troubled and traumatized by a lot of things but i also find a lot of legitimate joy in mm. the world and i'm grateful for a lot and that I realize I don't do often a great job of displaying that. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist for me in my heart, which mm. with me and God, I'm like, that's for me. And like, I almost feel like my joy is so precious that I often don't even want to share it and get, have it trampled on or be little because what I actually do find hopeful and joyful about the world to me is so large and so bigger that I'd rather scream a little bit and just be dissenting because there's some real shit going on in the world that needs to be talked about. But then the real precious thing in life to me is not the, that angst or that like protest. It's the joy and the delight that I find in my friends and in beauty and in art and nature and just fellowship with people that I feel genuinely loved and understood by. And it's like, how do you put that in a tweet? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think for me, sometimes when I go to... Um, when I go to post something, it, it feels a little bit like, you know, the hashtag blessed to be a blessing kind of things where I'm just like, uh, yeah, yeah. The cliche sentimentality, like, yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, life is Fake so spirituality. good. Yeah. And I'm just, that's a lot for me. And I know that 
it can be weird to share space as a, a, a space as big as social media and to be in a space where there is so much grief and yet there is so much gratitude and joy mm-hmm. and to just kind of waltz in with your own. It's kind of like how I think a lot of religious communities do a really poor job of dealing with people who are in grief and sorrow because they're yes. like, we we just want to be like a joyful space. And it's like, right, but life has all of the emotions going on for different people at yes. different moments. And how can you hold space for all of those realities yes. individually at the same time? And that's a really difficult thing for people to do. It is. And I think that social media is like that room where it's, you've got people that are, you know, grieving loss. You've got people that are just getting their dream jobs. You've got mm-hmm. people falling in love. You've got people falling out of love, yeah. like all in the same room. And how do you, authentically hold space for everyone's process. Totally. And I, I fight to celebrate the joys and the breakthroughs that happen in each of our lives. So if it's the job, a friend of mine got a job at Buzzfeed as a video editor. And that was like a dream opportunity because she wants to be a director. Eventually she wants to be the next Ava DuVernay. And I'm like, black girl magic, get it, go for it. And learning to celebrate her. She just had a video go viral, 3 million views. And that's her first like viral thing she's done. And, and so take even on Twitter, taking the moment to like, you know, congratulations, sis, like you're doing it. I'm proud of you. Like, like championing each other mm. is so important. I might not tweet my joy list every day or, you know, because for the obvious reasons, because there's so much pain right now that's unearthing. And I think we need to honor that pain because we've done so much for so long by uh, to dishonor that pain that I think. I've personally shifted in maybe a pendulum swing to be like, no, let's talk about the grief. Let's talk about the pain. Let's talk about the shit. Let's talk about the hard things. Because for so long, it was all like Joel Osteen spirituality, which I like <laughs> Joel. Actually, I've met him. He's a great guy. <laughs> He's a and genuine guy, actually. People don't realize that about him. Uh, but that is not the fullness of life in that, you know, like it, we got to really sink into the real hard stuff and, and unearth the stories that have been suppressed. And so I, that's what I want to do. But that still doesn't take away from my desire to celebrate the other, to celebrate my family, my sister, my brother, who are succeeding and uh, personally, as well as publicly doing it. I think it's important. And I think even for black people, I've been very conscious of that, To, I just know when black people succeed, we're, we're all succeeding. Well, when anyone truly succeeds, we're all succeeding. But I know that for black people, I exist in my space as an artist and advocate for the healing and liberation of black people everywhere. Because when black people are fully set free and liberated, then, then the rest of America and the fullness of, like we're made a fuller and richer humanity, all humanity because of that. Like when any group is oppressed, it's the same thing. Like I'm for the liberation, you know, of, of women. Because mm. when women are free, we're all, as men, like I, as a man, I'm freer when you're free. When you are paid the same, I'm free. It's not, just, you know, like, so my freedom is bound up in you. My my breakthrough is bound up in you. So we got to celebrate it. I have to, the little breakthroughs and the, I've got to applaud it. I've got to celebrate it yet still hold that space for the pain and the, the marginalization, the oppression and the victimization that is truly happening in this world that is sickening. Mm. And I don't know, there's room for both. God's table is so big and he's in all of it. And so I just go, if he's there, I'm there. If he's in the grief, I'm there too. If he's in the joy, I'm there too. Mm. I just want to be where God's at and he's everywhere. Love it. And also, you know, getting getting kind of serious about, um, you know, showing up for, for marginalized groups. Mm-hmm. You know, you were someone that walked arm in arm with me in the Women's March back yes. in January. And like that meant so much because you're someone who could easily be like, sorry, my group isn't even seen yet. Why am I going to show up for your group? Mm-hmm. And yet you didn't. And that I think that's what that's there's so much to learn in that. There's so much unity in that because yeah. you're not like, sorry. You know, I'm still, yeah. my black people are still being uh, marginalized every time I turn around. So mm-hmm. I don't have time to show up for your people. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's when we all show up for each other's freedom and, yeah. and for all of us to have equality and yeah. be seen. There's a lot in that. And I really, yeah. I felt that, um, that respect and love from you in a way that not every, not every man shows, especially not every black man. So black thank you. Christian man that grew up conservative in a lot of ways. Uh, oh, girl. Yeah. You're showing them. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I, I, I remember telling you uh, after I posted photos from the Women's March, I'm like, I lost 300 followers by posting photos of the Women's March. My, that conservative Christian audience does not like that. And you were like, why does it even matter? <laughs> and I was kind of like, 
Well, it does, but then I was like, well, it actually really doesn't. You're like, good riddance. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. if they if that alone offended them, you know? And for me, it's funny because I felt like I, when, when you hurt, I hurt. When my brother or sister hurts, I hurt. And that's the grief thing. And I, I think that's, it's wild because... I feel like the culture gets that more than the church. And that 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 concept is in the Bible. <laughs> when you hurt, I hurt. And, you know, like God asked Cain, who killed his brother Abel, uh, where is your brother? And he looks at him and he says, or looks at God or however the story goes. He says, what, what am I my brother's keeper? And it was the question, am I my, my brother's keeper? Actually, the answer is, no, you're not your brother's keeper. You are your brother. Boom. That's it. Yeah. When you hurt, I hurt. So the, the violent act of Cain killing his brother Abel was not even just, how dare you kill someone? You killed yourself. You, when, when, when they hurt, you hurt. You are now cut off from your fullness as a human. You're cut off from the possibility that this other, that is your brother, has for you in, in life. And, and now your your conscious is has the guilt of that violence. And when we do emotional violence to each other, when we scapegoat each other, and when we project our insecurities and our sin onto each other, our sin, onto when I project my sin onto you, I'm dehumanizing you. I'm making you less of a human. But when I honor you, when I honor you as a woman, when I honor you as a human being, I receive the fullness too. So I'm blessed. So when I bless you, I'm blessed. And mm. so the Women's March for me was just a way to bless <laughs> Truthfully, and I hate that, you know, a lot of my conservative Christian friends couldn't enter into that space, regardless of your views on abortion. And for a lot of them, they didn't want to participate because of that. Yeah. And I go, well, you're lost. Because that was one of the most beautiful marches here in L.A. that I was able to be a part of. And I feel like it was historic. And I want to stand for anyone who's hurting. And I want them to stand for me. So give un do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And mm -hmm. I think that's the way of God and it's the way of life. Yeah. Yeah. And whether or not you want to jump into the full religion of, you know, some people would say God means getting involved in religion, but I just think. No, I don't even mean it that way. Yeah, I know. That's what I, that's what I'm saying. There's, there's so much freedom and truth and empowerment in what you're saying, whether or not you want to see it as anything yeah. to do with any sort of religion or spirituality. Oh, totally. I, I know atheists that have a better grasp on the gospel. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do. Who understand the point of love your brother. Hey, I don't know what if I believe there's a literal God somewhere or if, if there's a heaven or a hell or if there's a afterlife or if, if any of that is real or bad. I, I don't even care about that. How do you treat the one in front of you? which was the whole point of the text. It was the whole point that Jesus came and laid down his life for. And when you use that phrase, we use it as God in Christ would rather lay down his life for his enemies than to use violence against them. Mm. Yep. The notion that God is, you know, he on the cross, they're like, I could call 10,000 angels to deliver me and whatever. But he said, I'd rather die by the hands of a mob to show them what true love means, that I would rather die by the hands of my enemy than to exert violence against them. To breathe. If, if I am God, if I truly am the son of God, then I am all powerful and I can use that power to exert my power over humanity. I could be like Pharaoh. I could be like uh, the Babylonians. I could be like Nero. I could be like Hitler. And if truly the temptations of Jesus and with the whole imagery of Satan and Jesus was all about, will you bow down and I'll give you, if you bow down Jesus, I'll give you the kingdoms of the earth. Meaning if you take the path of Pharaoh, if you exert power over your enemy, using violence, then you will, you will be no different from any authoritarian. And truthfully, God in Christ chose to lay down his life to say, this is what love looks like. No greater love is this than a man who laid down, lays down his life for his friend. So you don't even have to believe any of that stuff is literal. You don't have to believe it was historical. But the principle and the metaphor is real, regardless where you sit on that debate. And that to me is where I go. And atheist understands that. Some, I, I've met atheists who understand that better than many religious people who fight for the literalism of the text but miss the point. You who know the scriptures, Jesus said. You who know them and search them out, yet you, you miss the point. You are whitewashed tombs. He was so radical. Oh, That's why I'm a Christian, because I actually see that. I read those texts and I go, he was radical. And I think most people in culture understand that, whether you buy into the, the literalism of the text or not.
mm. in the heart of that. I see the heart of that at the I saw the heart of that at the women's march. And I went, there's God. There he is. There's there there she is. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> there she is. Hey, girl. Women's March. <laughs> God is not male or female. He is trans and other. <laughs> anyway. Getting radical. Yeah, we are. We're, we're preaching. This is radical grace and inclusion and theology. And I don't know. One day the world will see it. We'll come to the revelation. Of Hopefully it. in our lifetime. Hopefully. I'll, I'll fight for that, actually. Love it. I'll be there. Um, so back to social media for a couple last quick questions. Um. I feel like I could talk to you all day. We can because we just do this, right? I know. This is, this, we family. Like we just we just dive in. Um, so so back to social media and your journey because you've been on it for a really long time and you've changed a lot in those years. Oh yeah. So is there anything that you looking back, you're like, oh, I wish I hadn't put that out there. Sure, um, but. I think deep down, yeah, there might be, there's comments like, oh, I wish I wouldn't have said that about Jay-Z eight years ago. That was dumb, you know, or I wish I wouldn't have uh, critiqued that thing too heavy because truthfully, I realized I wasn't seeing it rightly. Hmm. But I didn't honestly do a lot of that. I think even early on in my, even in my more religious phases, I was still very open and inclusive uh, for the most part. And I honor those phases. Like I can't, dishonor them though i think so radically differently in a lot of ways than i do than i did five years ago or eight years ago or 10 15 years ago that's where i was at it was my it was my context yeah so for me to be a whole integrated person i have to bless that and say you were okay right where you were at yeah you weren't woke enough <laughs> though truthfully the seeds of wokeness uh were always there in I could, that's a whole other story <laughs> about my childhood education where I was literally trained by uh, a lot of like black activists. <laughs> that's cool. like third through fifth grade, actually. I went to an all black magnet school in Detroit that was woke as woke could get for 1992. <laughs> cool. Seriously. And it's funny because a lot of those seeds came back to bear later on. I was like, almost like I forgot it. And I went, oh my God, Trayvon Martin woke me up. But um, so I honor those phases. I honor it all. I don't regret it. They were where I was. If that makes any sense, I don't even know. Yeah, absolutely it does. That's beautiful. Um, it's beautiful and it makes sense because I think it, it's easy to it's easy to kind of look back at different phases, even to look at photos of myself in middle school and yeah. be like, oh my gosh, how embarrassing or like how, oh, I feel guilt or shame or awkwardness or anything about it. And mm -hmm. there's so much more kind of freedom to just be like, that was me in that yeah. moment. And if if I changed that and wanted to make that photo look different or wanted to make myself look less nerdy or, you know, have, uh, you know, get rid of my braces or whatever it mm -hmm. was that was awkward, um, I wouldn't be who I am now yep. because you change one thing and everything changes. Everything changes. We've seen that in, in enough movies yeah. to get the concept. Yep, of course. <laughs> Well, now, you know, we're we're relatively new to this internet thing, right? And I feel like I was never good at keeping a journal. I tried to multiple times, but I've now realized that my social media history is a public journal. And it's it's a live journal, no pun to the website. Um, <laughs> but like, it's a type of live journal of my journey. And though, don't go back and read it. <laughs> I'm Partly I'm thinking recently, I need to go shut some of that stuff down and like make it private. Uh, yeah, for tons of reasons. But um even just to preserve it and save it and to go, these were my thoughts and feelings in the times that I lived in. I could probably honestly go back and write a book about my life just from reading those Facebook statuses, from seeing those pictures, from reading those tweets from nine years ago. Um, Cause they'll put me back in that time frame where I've probably forgotten it's not in my consciousness, but I, if I see a tweet from nine years ago, I'll be right back there. So in that way, I'm thankful too, because it's a type of public autobiography, truthfully. Even if it's fragmented, it is windows of the soul that social media has offered to us to preserve because it's for some reason I like external processing. I'm I'm a deep internal processor, but then I'm very quick once I've kind of grasped something a bit to like then externally process it. And then I get more as I externally process. So I've been very good at both. And so my social media presence is ultimately the first inkling that I feel from an internal prop processing um it's not just off the head it's more of like oh i've been wrestling with this concept for three days and now i actually internally and i'm not even always cognitive of it 
And then the, by the time I'm starting to tweet generally or f- write a Facebook status, it's because I've been casually, unconsciously and consciously thinking about that idea. Mm. So I love, and I love that we have that, uh, that I don't know. I, know. I love that we can see each other's processes with this type of social media and I think it's valuable. I, I agree. I love it. So uh, I know I told you and I told you about how I have a partner with my my very first year of podcasting yeah. and it's Cat Footwear, which I'm awesome. stoked about because um, I actually trek in their boots all the time. <laughs> so it's pretty dope. So one of the things that we have in common is they're like a Michigan company represent. Yeah, and yeah, Detroit. Like, hey. mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep. They're like small town, but really big, big dreams, big goals and putting yourself out there with creativity. And so one of the one of the things that I love about you and your process, especially over the past couple of years that I've known you, is that you have been tapping into this this part of you that is more of an activist that gets your words and your beliefs out there in a little bit more of a jar. I don't want to say jarring, but you're like a little bit more of an activist in putting your putting what you really think out there. Um so how do you do that and welcome your followers into a new idea that doesn't alienate them? It kind of introduces them to your your take on things, whether it's to do yeah. with politics or, you know, whatever it is. How do totally. you do that? You know what? Actually, I don't do it. And uh, partially because the topics that I tend to talk about are usually uh, in regards to racism, white supremacy. That's kind of become like a more like niche for me. Um uh, I mean, we were on the we did the liturgist podcast uh, with Propaganda and Science Mike and Michael Gunger, and that that podcast uh, that was the first time I'd ever sp- publicly spoken about racism in a real way. Wow! Um, and that was a game changer for me. That podcast has been downloaded now over three million times. Uh, it's called Episode Thirty Four, Black and White, uh, on brand. Um, <laughs> but um, so when when I've, with the topic of racism, racism in its core is irrational. It's not a rational concept. It's actually, now there might be an intellectual and power structure behind it that rationalizes it, but the actual issue of supremacy is irrational. So when I would try to rationally explain to people why racism is bad, they didn't often get it because it's irrational. It's like when you're... When any of us are being irrational, it can be hard to present logic and reason. <laughs> it's oh, yeah. Like, it's impossible. Yeah, it's impossible. Um, so the nature of protest is uh, is good. Uh, I, I say this, uh, you know, to use Christian language, right? You know, we, uh, the Bible talks about their powers and principalities, you know, rulers in high places of spiritual wickedness. And people say, oh, it's a demon. Sure. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but what I do know is uh, if, if racism is irrational, it's also a, a power structure and a principality. And you can't rationalize with a power structure and a principality. You have to exercise it. So the way you do an exorcism is to disrupt the pattern. And protest in and of itself is is disrupting, even in the brainwaves, it's disrupting a pattern. And it's disrupting a power structure. And we're disrupting uh, a way of feeling comfortable and safe in the world. And so by doing that, what happens is the demons manifest itself. The mm. rage, and we saw that it this last weekend with the take the knee, the the with Trump and and black athletes, and that the that rage that people in this country feel like, how dare you kneel? You should be grateful for what we gave you. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Like we didn't earn this. Like we didn't help build this country too. Ooh, yeah, um, that's the demon that's manifesting. Yeah, so you you don't necessarily try to just gently walk into a space. You're more of a loving interruption. I'm a loving interruption. I will disrupt the pattern. I will dis I will jar you to the point where you go <gasps> for for my audience and my context. Like I don't do I actually could be far worse, but I truthfully do it to a level that I personally feel comfortable with. I disrupt the pattern and then you you manifest your demons on me. Mm. And then we can maybe talk. Why do you feel that way? Look at that interaction we're having right now. Mm. And uh, I'm actually more loving and patient one-on-one with the topic or with friends or with people that genuinely, even if they disagree with me, want to, if I'm one-on-one with you, I, I'll still disrupt the pattern, but I, I will more graciously walk through it. But with social media, there's no way to do that. So we exist to disrupt the pattern. And so what's beautiful is I've had people come to me now that have followed me for a while in my journey. A lot of people have, have left, but a lot of people that, and especially a lot of 
uh, older white people who go, you know, I follow you on Twitter. They don't, they don't favor it. They don't like or comment, but they'll come up to me in person and say, your feet is good for me. It disrupts my pattern. It makes me think in ways that, you know, and in that way, it's beneficial. In that way, I'm going, I'm not going to teach you everything you need to know. I can't teach you everything you need to know. But if you can see my process, it can disrupt that pattern and multiple other people people's processes. Then what comes up for you will be revealing for you. And that's truthfully when it comes to racism, the best that we can actually do. Because again, it's irrational. It's not, well, if we just sit down and really understand each other, you know, it's like when it comes to that one, no, actually we, we can't until the bias and the prejudice is seen for what it is. And that doesn't happen until there's a revealing. And it, to me, it's very spiritual. I feel like the culture war we're in now is actually a spiritual war in that way. Because these ancient, the original sin of this nation, the ancient, the ancient old power structures of the Western world that's been built on genocide, <laughs> colonization, <laughs> right? Like we're actually talking about them in such public ways now that we've never done it. So I think with social media, um, I don't personally walk people into that process. I jar them into it lovingly. And long term, we'll see if that's a great strategy or not. But we're in it and we're in the moment. And that's the road I've taken. Last two questions. So what do you do to... Self-care to self-love. Mm. I love myself. Uh. <laughs> when I think about you, I love Ugh. myself. Hey, hey. I just changed the words. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. You were singing a totally different song. Um, I, I don't do as well with self-care as I could do. And I'll, be, I'll just be vulnerable about that. But things I do, I take showers. As someone who's always in his head, Taking a shower puts me back in my body because I can get worked up. I love concepting ideas and getting like and drilling into ideas and and it, but that's very intellectual, heady. Like, and my heart's connected a bit, but it's we're fleshing out arguments and ideas and whatever. And I do that through Twitter a lot and and so showering, <sighs> throw some Solange on. Mm. I try to drink it away. Doom doom doom. I tried to put one in the air. Like, just... She's my queen. She's my queen. I saw her at Hollywood Bowl the other night God, while you were at Hamilton. Uh, Jesus, that woman. Uh, when well, That's where I saw Janet Mock. Uh, it was, yeah, incredible. But albums like that are self-care for me. Kendrick is like self-care in a rageful way. <laughs> um, music that makes me want to dance. Music that makes puts me in my heart takes me out of my head and puts me in my heart. Um, India Ari does that for me as an artist. She just released a new record called Songversation, another one that's like acoustic driven. And there's songs in there that feel like songs of adoration to the universe. And I actually will play that sometimes uh, and just meditate. Meditation, yeah, meditation as well. Um, though I've been very inconsistent with it, but I will, even if it's just, I try to go 10 minutes, sit, get into your body, get into, because my I think my power as a person is always authenticity in my gut. At my, when I can take a heady concept, funnel it into my heart, find the emotional aspects, and then move from a place of instinct and guttural power to express that idea through art, dance, talking, speak, like, then I'm in my sweet spot. I'm in my power. Um, but I often struggle to get in my heart, I often struggle to get in my gut, or to, exp to take action. Mm. And that is, so self-care, when I do it, it connects my three, you know, intelligence centers, head, heart, gut, right? Enneagram. We just did this. Thank you for that seminar, by the way, Caroline. <laughs> um, when I, that seminar helped me realize that's how I center. And I'm my best as a performer, as a singer, songwriter, as an artist, especially as a performer. I am my best when I can connect those three and take the brainy ideas, put some emotional heart into it, and then express it through my body. Mm. Like, that is my power. And that's when I feel the most connected to God and like I'm executing my purpose. That's when I feel the most whole as a human is when I perform live. I do. It's There's something. It's not just the, the rush, the chemical rush of the adrenaline of the high. It's like I am because if I'm a five on the Enneagram, then that go, means I go to eight uh, for health and I become a challenger. And, my, and musically, like I go, I get into this like fierce state as a musician. Like I just the way I hone in. Because I can be kind of scatterbrained a lot. But then something about music, especially live performing, hones me in. Um, yeah. And I would actually love to take learn to take that power and do that through social media better. Mm. Um, and I've, I've done it. 
I've hit good moments when, with it, but I'm still even learning because the, the algorithms are always changing and the like, and, and I'm always taking in information because the world is so, and so how do I then process that information and then execute it? And how do I execute it? Um, so self-care helps me be a, fulfill my calling better. It, you know, it's, uh, the Bible says my cup overflows. So what's in the cup is for me. What comes out is the abundance for everyone else. So if I'm not filling my cup, then I don't have, I can't give out of the overflow. I'm only giving out of what's for me. And mm. then that becomes emotionally and spiritually dangerous. Um, because I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm stealing from myself. I'm robbing myself of what I need to feel okay in the world. And that is so important, I think, for each of us to know what do I need to do to feel okay and safe in the world. Fill your cup up with that. And then when you do your work, your calling, your activism, your art, your music, your business, your, you're doing it from a place of abundance and overflow, my cup runneth over. Mm. So all that that comes out is for you guys. But what's in the cups for me? And that's my self-care. Well, as I've only seen you perform, I think, twice. Mm-hmm. But it's definitely felt like I'm I'm getting a, a shower of abundance of like Ooh. it's not. Yeah, it's sort of this elevated. It's a, like as someone who hangs out with you all the time mm-hmm. and then I see you in that space, it's sort of like I have to like, ooh, sit up and take notice because <laughs> all of a sudden you're bringing it in this level of mm-hmm. kind of energy that is yeah. totally different to. I mean, it's not totally different, but it's just yeah. it's so much more intentional and like laser. Yeah, like is. you're just like so clear of what you're doing and why and what yeah. you're there to say. Um, and it's amazing. So I, yeah. I can't wait till your album Thank comes you. out because I've never actually seen you do your own stuff yeah. for like a whole a whole show. Yeah, I, I can't wait for that either. The album's called Cosmos with a K. Oh, hey. Hey, it's cosmic. <clears throat> Means integration of heart, mind, soul, spirit. It's uh, for God so loved the world. John 3.16, the word world in the Greek is cosmos. For God so loved the cosmos. We take that out, that redemption or forgiveness is not just for humanity, it's for the cosmos. That all things get healed and redeemed and reconciled in Christ. And I think that's, again, just a metaphor, whether you believe it literally or not. It's a metaphor for the coming together of all that is fragmented, that everything gets redeemed, that everything gets brought into its greater whole. So cosmos represents the spiritual, emotional, physical coming together of heart, mind, soul, body, of self, other people, and God, which is the cosmos and the universe. And so for God so loved the cosmos that he gave and that overflow and of, of the givenness, that God is of absolute givenness. And so when we're given to each other and we're given to love and we're given to the earth. I can't wait. Givenness, yeah, cosmos. Coming can't soon, wait. 2018. Can't wait. Uh, last question. What's something that you have in common with every single human? What do I have in common with every single human? Um that we are all simultaneously experiencing this wild ride called life. That I look at us sometimes and I just look at us and I go, you're new to this like me. (laughs) You're just riding this ride and I'm riding it too. And as firm or certain we feel about certain things in our lives, truthfully, we don't know. I don't know what's on the other side of death. I wish my religion truly gave me a total certainty of that, but it Mm. doesn't. But it tells me that either way, I'm okay. That either way, all will be well, whatever that means. Whether I am nothing and I return to nothingness or whether I am an intricate part of a greater whole and I'm conscious of that in an afterlife, I don't know. Uh, I think the one thing we share is the uncertainty and the absurdity of it all. And so I love that. And that's where I truly on a deep human connect with everyone on a human level, regardless of whatever your situation is, your belief system is. Yo, we're all just experiencing this ride together. We're all just making this up as we go and maybe paying attention to stuff written before us. And we're doing the best we can in this moment. So let's just calm down a bit and love each other and go have a drink <laughs> and be whole and happy and healed and in love with each other and, and all that is, which I define as God. Why not? Why not? That's a beautiful one. Thank you. You're My welcome. goodness. I can't wait to have you on again later. Yes. At, because these conversations are amazing. And um, it's been such a joy to get to 
intentionally carve out time in our busy lives to just chat yeah. about stuff. It's been really beautiful. Yeah. And I thank you for allowing me on this podcast and to speak to uh, you guys because I respect you so much. I think you are you and Jaden are some of my favorite people to watch and to be friends with because you're go getters. You say what you, you say what you mean and you do what you say and you follow through and the intentionality that you bring to every relationship and every your business and your career it's astounding to watch i feel like i just like take notes and i just go i learn and i'm like this is how you do it because you know i'm i feel like I'm, I'm basically just a glorified church kid that's learning how to just be who he is in the world you know <laughs> like growing up in the religious bubbles that i did and so and i know you know some of your both of your stories with that too you know are a little similar but different um but you guys give me such assurance and hope that you can be who you want to be in the world and it's okay and it's good. And so I thank you for that. And I thank you for even allowing me to be on this podcast because I think the world of you. And so I really do. Thank you. Love you. Love you too, friend. And uh, let's keep drinking. <laughs> let's hey. go dancing. Oh yeah. We've done that a few times. <laughs> we do live crazy lives. Now that I think about it. <laughs> I love it. They're the good kind. Yeah, they are. Mwah. Awesome. Love you. Thank you. You've been listening to Out of Line with Caroline Lee. Tweet me at Team Woodnote or tag me in your posts on Instagram using Out of Line Podcast. And let me know what you thought of today's discussion and who you'd like to hear as a guest on Out of Line next. This episode of Out of Line was produced by me, Caroline. All sound editing, engineering, and original music composition by Jaden Lee. And a big thank you to Cat Footwear for working with Out of Line this season. Hit subscribe to get the next episode on your mobile device when it drops next week. And if you love what you heard, please whip out a review, will ya? <laughs>